Living in the Blue Mountains near Sydney is a survivor of what should have been terminal cancer. For 50 years, her identity and her secret have been known only to her family and a select few deep inside the Vatican. But this shy woman is Mary McKillop's and Australia's first official miracle. Do you feel like a miracle? How does a miracle feel? Um, I feel very fortunate, very fortunate that I, I was given the opportunity to live my life. Even in hidden Vatican documents, Veronica Hobson is referred to only as X. In 1959, she married Alan, a tow truck driver. Two years later, at age 22, Veronica fell ill. I didn't feel well, so I went to my GP. Doctors diagnosed leukaemia. She was given no hope of surviving. It was like hot burning pain shooting up my spine. I couldn't bear for people to touch me. And my bones, if anybody touched me, it, it hurt. Did you think you were going to die? I think I wished I would a lot of the time because I, you know, I'd go to, at night, I'd think I don't want to wake up and go through this again tomorrow. You learned afterwards that the doctors believed you were going to die. Yes. And there's no doubt about that. No. As a girl, Veronica went to school at St Joseph's Convent in North Sydney, once home to Mary McKillop. I think my mother must have contacted the sisters and the sisters that came to see me were the ones that taught me in primary school and gave me little relics, which was of the cloth, some of the cloth that Mary McKillop wore, and said they were praying to Mary for me. Do you believe your recovery was a miracle? Yes, I do. Why do you believe? Because I got better and I had children and that was, that gave me hope to keep going on. Well, I think I can say in the 50s and the 60s, virtually no one recovered from acute leukaemia, child or adult. So you didn't expect her to live at all? No. Professor James Biggs was her doctor. Years later, he would provide evidence to the Vatican. So was it a miracle? It may well have been a miracle. I wrote a letter to the Vatican and I supplied them with all the clinical and laboratory material. What did you tell them? I told them this was a very unusual result for a patient with acute leukaemia treated in the 1960s. Can I be cynical just for one moment and yes, be the sceptic? Well, there's more sceptics in the world than Sure, you. but what if in a hundred years time scientists discover that the reason you got better wasn't because of a miracle but because of something that they now understand happened scientifically? I won't be here. <laughs> <laughs> You're still um, sure? I'm still sure, yes. Indeed, Veronica's always believed she had another miracle delivered by Mary McKillop. Now, you weren't meant to be able to have children, were you? Because that of the was treatment. what I was told, yes. Brett was supposed to be born in September. He was born a month premature. And he was actually born on the anniversary of Mary McKillop's death. And when the nuns came to visit me and Brett, they called him Mother Mary's baby. So have you ever sat in class and wanted to go, my mum's a miracle? I wish I could just go, that's my mum! <laughs> Veronica went on to have six children and now four grandkids. Does it feel special? Yes, it does. I think it does. Oh, it doesn't. Yes, it does. Honestly, Veronica, for a miracle, you are the shyest, most retiring miracle I've ever met. <laughs> <laughs> well, I am retired. <laughs> Mary McKillop was anything but retiring. Born in Melbourne in 1842, she founded the St Joseph's Order of Nuns devoted to helping the poor. After her death in 1909, many believers began praying to her for help. By 1925, there were already calls for her to be made a saint. In 1995, Pope John Paul II agreed that Veronica's survival was a miracle, and he secretly met with her in Sydney. He was a wonderful man, 
very approachable and he told me I was a very special person and that was a bit embarrassing because I don't consider myself a very special person at all. But the Catholic Church does and her case was critical to Mary's canonisation. That represents about 50 years of work of many people. Father Paul Gardner was appointed to gather the evidence and make the case to Rome that Mary should be a saint. I would have thought this would get anyone canonised, but just to get the cause introduced, you needed that. They call him the postulator. Now, from what you've said, to be a saint, there has to be no other explanation for why that person got better. That's or... the ultimate question the doctors are asked. They are asked about the evidence and, and the diagnosis, the prognosis and the therapy and so on, whatever. but then ultimately they're saying, uh, can you explain the course of this illness which has resulted this way by your medical knowledge? But there is one other test. To achieve sainthood, there have to have been two miracles. It makes me very humble to be a part of Australia's first saint, it's pretty big. Kathleen Evans from Newcastle was expected to die from lung and brain cancer in 1993. On her deathbed, she constantly prayed to Mary MacKillop and wore a relic of her clothing. Still wears it privately today. Oh dear. Um, it's on my bra. <laughs> Mary prayed with us and as soon as we came out and knew it was gone, we just said, thank you God, thank you Mary. Last year, Pope Benedict declared Kathleen was Mary's second miracle. It's blessed Mary McKillop. The investigators in the Vatican were convinced beyond all doubt. So they said it's an open and shut case and these are the people who usually <laughs> get very sceptical and cynical. How do we know that these people just didn't get better, as happens in medical science unexpectedly all the time. Sometimes people get better well, that's true for enough, no yes. known reason. But again, I go back to what the church uh, requires. Uh, there's an occurrence here which the doctors say they cannot now explain. That's all the church asks for. Mary MacKillop's followers believe she's still performing miracles. Two years ago, Irishman David Keoghan, a Lifeline volunteer, was savagely bashed in the Sydney beachside suburb of Coogee. Doctors thought he was brain dead. Did you ever think he would wake up? No, none of us did. We all thought the case was hopeless. So even though he had a heartbeat, there were actually no neurological signs of life other than his heartbeat. They didn't give David much hope of surviving. Uh, not, they didn't think that David would regain conscious. David's dad, Tom, raced from Ireland to be by his side. Looking at your son lying there in that state, was there a moment when you found yourself saying, how could any God let this happen to my child? I did question it, yes. I was asking, was there really a God? So your family prayed to Mary MacKillop? Yes, Mary MacKillop. But David's doctors were pessimistic. And David remained unconscious as he was wheeled out of hospital in Sydney to be flown to Ireland. Then, after eight months in a coma, in his hospital room in Cork, David stirred. That particular morning, the 15th of March, 2009, I went to the window to turn on David's favourite uh, CD and I heard a noise which I thought was, was morning, a little grunt. <laughs> yeah, I turned back to him to look at him and he was smiling and I had a mobile phone in my hand and I asked him what was it and again a bit of a grunt but I was able to make out mobile phone and from then on he just kept improving and do you believe that was a miracle i do yes he agreed if i woke up i could tell him a naughty word and that was yeah so 
when I did wake up and he was there, he was there with his mobile phone. Go on, David, raise your hand, ball, squeeze your hand with the ball. Lift the red ball. Well done, David. Said, Tom, if you don't. <laughs> <laughs> and how was that moment, uh, Tom? I was delighted to hear it. Delighted. Yeah. It's not Very every day happy. a father Very gets happy. abused by a son. Yes, yes. <laughs> it's well, the I... only day I get away with it, though. <laughs> <laughs> yes. When you heard that he was awake and talking and even walking eventually, what did you think? I remember being shown a, a picture of, of him talking or a little movie of him talking and just having this sense that I could not believe that that was the same boy. Can you give me a scientific explanation for his recovery? Not really. I mean, people get better. That's the case. And sometimes we can't explain why, but to go from such a, a, a you know, what, what, is, what are dire straits to what he is now, I can't think of an explanation. Are you a miracle? Um, well, I do think there has, a miracle has taken place because it was out of our hands. So is there really room in this day and age for the notion of an omniscient God up above bringing favour on some of us down below? Is there really such a thing as a miracle? Well, at the very least, these remarkable stories of recovery remind us there's always a place for hope, whether you're a believer or not. Is there a lesson that people who don't believe in God can take from what happened to you? Uh, I guess they, they must have some sort of hope, not just give in and just let illness or so sadness, things that happen in their life take over their life, just keep hoping that it will get better. Now 72, Veronica's own life after recovery has been far from easy. Brett, her miracle baby, died in a car accident at age 17. Her younger son, Mark, has a severe brain injury after another accident. And Veronica herself is recovering from a recent bout of bowel cancer. You have had a tough life. It hasn't all been light, has it? It hasn't, but I'm not the only one in this world who has a tough life. Never give up. Just keep hoping. OK, I want you all to say, miracle. Miracle! miracle. <laughs> well, it's a pleasure to have met Veronica, the miracle. Thank you very much. But don't call me a miracle. <laughs> I'm just an ordinary person.